And so when people tell me, oh, David, you know, your, your hope that we could live in a U.S. With a, where war is not foreign policy, if you want to live in a society where people have access to health care as a fundamental human right, if you, you know, your desire to transition away from our addiction to fossil fuels that are driving the global climate crisis, you're thinking too big. We can't make those kind of changes. I say, have you not been paying attention? I mean, the reality is that throughout all of world history, human beings have been able to make profound transformational change if they only commit themselves to it and they believe it. Because here's something, now that the Texan go get metaphysical, y'all, hold on. We are all individually participating in jointly creating our collective reality. Another way to say that is if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. It's true. And I've got to tell you, you know, I'm a Green Party member and I'm proud of it. But I'm also proud to say I work with progressive Democrats. I'll also tell you that on war and the Patriot Act, uh, I've worked with Republicans and Libertarians. I've worked with socialists. I've worked with anarchists. I've worked with communists. You know, I work with anybody, issue after issue, where we can find common ground. I have never met a monarchist with which I could work in alliance. <laughs> and I say that to really point out that they just don't exist anymore, right? And yet 500 years ago, that's basically all there were, at least in Europe. So don't tell me we can't make profound change. All we have to do is believe that we can make profound change, and that will create the circumstance where change will not only happen, it will become inevitable. That will lead me to my third concept that I want to make sure that we cover, and that's the doctrine of legal personhood. Now, you'll notice that I don't say corporate personhood, but legal personhood, because legal personhood is simply the idea that you can assert rights under law. So if you can assert rights, that means that you have legal personhood. Now, that's a very profound idea, and we'll cover that in just a moment, but I want you to just hold on to this idea. The idea of legal personhood means that you have the ability to assert rights under law. And that will lead me now to the fourth concept I want to make sure we cover, and that's the corporation itself. And you know, it's the last concept I want to cover, and sometimes I think it's because it's re what if it's the least important concept? What if really the more important issues are about us? about how we think of ourselves in this so-called democracy. What if the problem is that we're not actually acting as if we're sovereign, as if we have the authority to rule? What if the problem is really us and the corporation really isn't the issue at all? And as I say that out loud, I think, yeah, that's probably right. And then as soon as I say that, I say, Cobb, are you crazy? Of course that's not right. Because I know what you know, and that is that the large transnational corporations are at the root of virtually every single problem that we're facing today. In fact, I'll say it this way. I don't even talk about corporate power anymore. Because I don't think that unelected and unaccountable huge transnational corporations are merely exercising power. They are ruling us. As surely as masters once ruled their slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling us because they are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect all of our lives. They're deciding what our health care is going to be, or evermore what our health care won't be. Mm. They decide how much po poison will be spewed into the water that we're all collectively drinking, or the air that we're all having to breathe. Corporate CEOs are making the decisions about what our transportation choices are. They're making the decisions about whether or not this country goes to war. And in fact, to illustrate this point, a quick pop quiz. How many people here are eating transgenetic organisms, or also known as genetically modified organisms? Raise your hand. All right. In this crowd, of course, everybody raised your hand. Why did everybody raise your hand? Because we're in America. Because we're in America. And another way to say that, we are all eating these genetically mutated foods. Why? Because they're in the public food supply. But here's a question. I don't want to debate at this moment whether it's a good or a bad thing. I want to talk about the process of that decision. Who made the decision to genetically modify the public food supply of the United States of America? Yeah. Monsanto Corporation, Monsanto. Uh, Archer Daniels Midland Corporation, Pioneer Hybrid Corporation. These huge transnational corporations 
made what is obviously a public policy decision, and yet they made it behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. They claimed that it was a private decision. It was something that we, the people, were not able to participate in. In fact, we didn't even know it was happening until after the fact. And now the big fight in the United States around GMOs are label it. You know what the fight is in Europe and in Africa and in the global, all across the global south? Ban it. You see the difference? Right? I guess what I'm suggesting is this. In the United States of America, we the people and frankly we activists have a lot to learn from our sisters and brothers in the global south about what real movements do. About how real movements conduct themselves. Because I look at what's happening in the global south, in Latin America, in Africa, especially uh, going across the Middle East today, and I am stunned at the level of seriousness with, with, with which they take their efforts. And I'm going to tell you folks, it's about time that we in North America joined the movement, right? That's right. We need to join that movement and do so with some humility. <laughs> to do so with some humility to recognize that we've got a lot to learn from them about that. And since I think that corporation is so important, I'm now going to ask the same question. What language is this from? Latin. Latin. Corpus means body. And now for extra credit, the suffix T-I-O-N, it means the state of having or to give or have. So really the word corporation, if you just break it down, means to give or have body. And that's important because, uh, let me ask, are there any lawyers in the crowd besides me that would be willing to admit it? <laughs> this is a friendly crowd. No? All right, well, I'll just tell you. In law school, one of the first things they teach us about corporations are that it's a legal, a corporation is a legal fiction. Have y'all heard that? Mm -hmm. See several hands, mm -hmm. right? So a corporation is a legal fiction. All right, that's good. So here's a question. What does the word fiction mean? <laughs> Fake, not true, right? Not real. So here's something, y'all. We're taught in law school that a corporation doesn't really exist but we'll pretend like it exists so that we can treat this conglomeration of people and contracts and ideas as if it were one thing. We will give it body, even though it doesn't actually have body. And guess what? If enough people think something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. It's true. So presto changeo, a corporation can literally be created as a human construct. And in fact, that's how it happened. And the word corporation comes from Latin because the very first corporations that we would understand as corporations were actually created during the Roman Republic. Not during the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we spent more time asking ourselves, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States of America. <laughs> Flag that. We might, uh, we might come back to that. But the, the point is that the first corporations were actually created during the Roman Republic. And in fact, the road system, you know, it's kind of famous. The adage, all roads lead to Rome, y'all have heard of that, right? Mm -hmm. That road system was literally built by and maintained under the auspices of a Roman <coughs> corporation. Likewise, the aqueduct, that amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula without electricity, Human beings are clever. We can do amazing things. That aqueduct, that entire water system, was operated as an early Roman corporation. Likewise, the first universities were Roman corporations. The first hospitals that we would think of as a hospital, can you guess? That's right, they were Roman corporations. So here's a question. What does a road system, a water system, a hospital, a university, what do they all have in common? Engineers. <laughs> Fair enough, says our engineer, wants to remind us that engineers were involved, which is true. But I was thinking something else. There, I would say these are all public These are all public projects. These are all uh, efforts for the public good. And I think it's really important to recognize the genius of the creation of the construct of a corporation. Because David Cobb is not anti-corporation. Move to amend is not anti-corporation. The idea of being able to have a human construct that is able to actually consolidate either money or human effort or activity into one thing and put it to a public project, that is genius. And we should not lose sight of that. 
You know, um, in fact, to really put a put a, a point on it, let's say I have this great idea here in Houston, Texas, for how to create food security. You know, y'all have heard of uh, food security? It means basically that you are secure in knowing that you'll have enough food to eat now and the next time you're hungry. And I don't know about you, but I've gotten kind of used to eating every day. In fact, I like it so much, I like to do it multiple times during the day. And if you are secure in the knowledge that you'll be able to eat when you're hungry and you don't really have to spend much time worrying about it or thinking about it, that feeling is known as food security. And shamefully, in the richest country in the world, there is a huge percentage of Americans who are not food secure. And that means here in Houston, Texas. So I've got this great idea for how we can create absolute food security for everyone. And in doing so, we're going to be able to put all the unemployed and underemployed people, especially young people within the urban core, to work. We're going to make this elaborate system of community gardens. We're going to have community-supported agriculture. We're going to have people growing and preparing food and uh, doing it in different ways. And then there's going to be an elaborate distribution network so that low-income people and, and our elderly are going to have access to that food. And we're going to be creating community as we go. And it's all worked out. And I tell you in this... Uh, example, I'm, I'm working with community organizers and I'm working with gardeners, but I'm also working with academics. We've got it all lined up. All we need is a little bit of money. So I'll ask, uh, Don Cook, would you be willing to donate, say, $100 to this effort? Sure. Absolutely. How about you? George? Yes. How about you, ma'am? No, she says no. Well, um, is there any way I could entice you to do it? I don't know. Perhaps if we offered you a return on your investment. No. No, even still no. So now we'll just go to Wally. Wally, would you? And you see how that worked? And I want to point out the genius of the idea of the corporation is to take private monies and to put it to a public project. But it wasn't just private money, right? Because there's another way that sometimes private money will be taken. What are that for, by the government? What are that? What's that also called? Tax. Tax. Let me ask you something, Mike. Is that voluntary? No. When that when the Roman centurion shows up, does the Roman centurion outline all of the various things that will be done with your tax dollars? No. And does the Roman centurion, when somebody says no, I won't pay, does the Roman centurion say, "Can I entice you"? <laughs> no. The Roman centurion compels you. It's a mandatory thing. The genius of the corporation is to take private money or resources as a voluntary matter. Private money as a voluntary matter to put it to public use. That is a genius idea, and we should not lose track of that. It is a fantastic idea, but of course the problem is that the modern transnational corporation doesn't exactly work like that, does it? That's because the modern transnational corporation does not actually have its birth, really, in this concept. Instead, it comes out of the 13th, 14th, and 15th century of Europe. You know, the age of discovery. Mm -hmm. I have to put discovery in quotation marks because I told you all I would tell the truth. And it's not truthful to call that the age of discovery at all. After all, what did they discover and who was they? Well, they discovered Africa, Asia, later North America, South America. Of course, they are all European uh, conquerors. So, you know, newsflash, there were people living there. They weren't lost. <laughs> they didn't need to be discovered. So instead, in the interest of truth-telling, let's actually tell the truth. What is that era? It's the era of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. It's the age of empire. See, that's what imperialism means. And we should not sugarcoat it. We should not be afraid of actually telling the truth about that time period and what it meant. Imperialism is killing other people, stealing their resources, and then trying to justify it. And in fact, check this out, the birth of the modern transnational corporation came during the age of empire because it was created as an instrument of empire. Literally, the modern transnational corporations, these first so-called joint stock companies, were literally created in order to facilitate empire building. 
For example, one of the earliest corporations was known as the Dutch East Indies Corporation, which was specifically designed and chartered in order to allow the destruction and, and, and killing of all of those people around the Indonesian archipelago that we now know as Indonesia today and to steal those resources.